today we have with us Adam Tonhill uh, with his talk, A Crystal Ball to Prioritize Technical Debt. This session is sponsored to you by Agile Alliance. We would love to thank uh, Agile Alliance for sponsoring this session. So uh, without much delay, uh, Adam, if you can quickly just share your screen and then I will leave the stage to you. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to this session where we will go on a quest to find a crystal ball that helps us to not only identify, but also to prioritize technical debt. So this is a broad topic, so let me jump right in and start by defining what technical debt actually is. So the definition I use for technical debt is Martin Fowler's well-known definition. And the idea is that technical debt, just like we can take on financial debt, to buy something we want right now, we can do the same thing with technical debt, right? We can make shortcuts in our solution and maybe we will be able to deliver quickly in the short term, but, and here's the key, there's a price to that. And to me, this is the most interesting aspect of technical debt. Technical debt incurs interest payments. And this is something that I've found that we in the software industry, we tend to oversimplify and occasionally even misuse the concept of technical debt. Meaning that the concept of technical debt might not be as helpful as it could be. So let me explain why by having you do a very small experiment. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to put up some code here, a small code snippet on the screen. And your task is to quickly judge the quality of that code. So have a look at this beauty. What do you think about this code? Yeah, uh, I think you agree with me that this is not good code. In fact, this is code that's going to be very, very prob problematic in case it grows. That programming style won't scale at all. It would be a mess. And of course, we would never ever write something like this ourselves, right? But is it a problem? More importantly, is it technical debt? The thing is, from code alone, we just cannot tell. And the reason we cannot tell is because it's not technical debt unless we have to pay interest on it. An interest rate, interestingly enough, is a function of time. Meaning that if we want to, cons if we want to decide if this code is technical debt or not, we would need a time dimension into our code. How can we get such a thing? Well, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you one possible approach. But before we go there, I would like to share a story with you that relates to the code snippet I just showed you. So I analyze code for a living. I develop tools for software analysis, and I occasionally I go to different organizations and I analyze their code and try to prove test their technical debt. And this is something that happened to me four or five years ago. So at this time, I was visiting a large client and prior to my arrival, they had done something very interesting. They had used a static analysis tool capable of quantifying technical debt. And the way those tools work is simply that they, they scan a source code and each time they find a violation of a rule, they have a cost assigned to it. You know, for example, you have uh, overly complicated logic in a function that takes you two hours, hours to refactor. So now we have two hours of technical debt. Or maybe you're public functions lack documentation. So that takes five minutes to fix. So now we have two hours and five minutes of technical debt and so on. And they come up with a number. And in this organization, they have taken one such tool and thrown it at their 15 year old code base. And this tool reported that on your 15 year old code base, you have accumulated 4,000 years of technical debt. 4,000 years of technical debt I mean, just to put it into perspective for you, 4,000 years ago, that's here. That's the start of recorded history via the invention of writing. So, you know, almost on a side note, I'm curious what kind of programming language did they use? Most likely a Fortran, right? Now, jokes aside, I actually think that 4,000 years of technical debt on a 15-year-old code base I understand that a lot of that potential debt grew in parallel by having hundreds of developers working on the code. But at the end, how useful is it to know? It's depressing for sure, but how do you act upon it? Is all that equally important? And besides that, I think it's a 
mistake to try to quantify technical depth from code alone. And the reason you cannot do that is because most of the things we call technical depth just aren't technical at all. More specifically, what I tend to find when I work with different organizations is that we, as a development organization, we tend to mistake organizational problems for technical issues. And the consequence is that we start to address symptoms instead of the real root causes. And I'm going to give you some examples later in this session, but for now, I just want to state that I think the main reason that we keep making misattributions like this is because the organization is invisible in the code itself. And that's why we're unfortunate, because there is a strong link between technical depth and the organization. And we just cannot address technical depth unless we take a holistic view of it. And that holistic view has to include an organizational and social view of the code base. So what I wanted to do now is to raise awareness of the challenges when trying to prioritize technical depth. And based on what I covered so far, I put together a wish list. I put together a wish list with the ideal information that I think we need to prioritize technical depth. So let me share that list with you and let's see if you agree on it. I really hope you do, otherwise it becomes a very short session. So first of all, when prioritizing technical depth, if we should address any depth, we should focus on the depth with the highest interest, right? The most expensive depth. So where is it? The second thing I would like to know is, what about the software architecture? Does the software architecture support the way our system evolves? Are we working with or against our software architecture, which is actually quite common? And you will see examples on that as well. Finally, I talked about organizations. What does technical depth look like from the organizational perspective? Are there any productivity bottlenecks? You know, those parts of the code where five different feature teams constantly have to coordinate their efforts. Now, looking at this list, I hope you agree with me that this is information that's going to be potentially useful for us to prioritize and address technical depth. But what I want to point out is that none, really none of this information is available in the code itself. From code alone, we just cannot answer any of these questions. So how and where can we get the data we need to answer those questions? Well, those of you who might have read one of my books or attended any of my previous sessions, you know that I'm a big, 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 big fan of version control data. Yeah, I know, we all have our odd hobbies and this one happens to be mine. The reason I'm so fascinated with version control data is because it's something we have used as a backup system, an overly complicated backup system, and then occasionally maybe as a collaboration tool. But in doing so, we have built up this absolutely wonderful behavioral data source over how we, as an engineering organization, have interacted with our code. And we can tap into version control data to calculate a lot of interesting metrics and statistics that can help us answer those questions I raised that let us prioritize technical depth. So let me jump right in and show you a concept called hotspots based on version control data. And I'm going to walk you through it. Let's start with an evolutionary view of our code base. So what you see here is something I call a hotspot analysis. And I'm going to walk you through the visualization the visualization you see is a visualization of a well-known Java code base, Tomcat. And there's nothing special about Tomcat. I just wanted to pick something that some of you are likely to be familiar with. The way you read this visualization is that if we focus on those large blue circles that you see, the ones that blink on screen right now, each one of those represents a top-level folder in that code base. And inside of that, uh, folder, you have other folders that are also visualized as large circles. So this means that this is a completely hierarchical visualization that follows the structure of your code. It's also interactive, so I can zoom in on any area that I'm interested in. And once I get to the lowest level of detail, I see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle. So you might see the different red circles here. You see they have different size, different colors. So let me explain how that works. The size of a circle that I use to represent a file 
is used to measure code complexity. Now, what is code complexity? Well, fundamentally, it's about how hard is this code for a human to understand. And if you worked in the software industry for a while, you know that there are multiple ways of measuring uh, code complexity. We have things like cyclomatic complexity, cognitive complexity, health that's volume metrics. And the truth is that you can use any metric that you have easy access to, because what they all have in common is that you're equally bad. Code complexity is simply too complicated to measure with a single metric. And when you look at the research, you will see that the moment you start to control from the number of lines of code in a file, more elaborate metrics rarely add any further predictive value. So unless you already have some of those more advanced metrics in place, I recommend that you just count the number of lines of code. And the reason I say this is because code complexity is the least, I repeat, it's the least important dimension. Because complexity only has this property that it's only interesting when we need to deal with it. So we need to figure out, does this potentially access complexity? Does it have an impact on us? And this is data that we can pull out of a version control system. We can look at each module and see how many changes, how much development activity do we have in each part of the code? We can just calculate the number of commits of each file and use color to represent that. And by combining these two perspectives, we can identify complicated code that we have to work with often. And those are our hotspots. So returning to the visualization here, now that we know what it, how to read it, we see that there are a number of potential hotspots in the Tomcat code base. And to me, and from the perspective of technical depth, a hotspot simply means that that's the part of the code where it's really, really important that the code is clean, simple and easy to understand and easy to evolve because we're going to spend so much development time in those areas. However, in practice, more often than not, the opposite is true. And that tends to make hotspots into excellent refactoring candidates. And there's a fascinating reason why hotspots work so well as refactoring candidates. And it's a reason captured by one of my favorite authors, Mr. George Orwell. So maybe some of you have read George Orwell's work. Maybe you're familiar with Animal Farm. If you read Animal Farm, then you might recognize the next quote. Because in Animal Farm, George Orwell states that all code is equal, but some code is more equal than others. And I'm pretty sure I understand what George Orwell meant with this. It's actually a deep insight into software development. Because George Orwell was most likely referring to the next slide. So please have a look at these graphs. The three examples you see at the top all show the same kind of data. On the x-axis, we have each file in a code base, and they are sorted according to the change frequency. That is how many changes, how many commits do we do to that file. And the number of commits is what we see on the y-axis. Now, if you look at those three examples, you see there are examples from completely different code bases developed in different programming languages, by different organizations, targeting different domains, different lifetime spans. Everything is different, right? And yet, they all show exactly the same pattern. They show a power law distribution. And this is something I've found in every single code base that I've ever analyzed. And I probably analyzed around 300 code bases by now. So this seems to be the way software evolves. And this is important to us because what it means to us is that if we want to address technical depth, what we should do is we should prioritize improvements to the head of the curve where most of the development activities. And this is actually a positive message because what these graphs show us is that most of our code is going to be in the long tail. So it means it's code that's rarely, if ever, touched. And that's the part of the code where we can actually live with a certain degree of technical depth. We can live with it safely because the interest rate is so low. On the other hand, even a minor amount of technical depth in a hotspot is likely to be expensive. So this is why hotspots work so well to prioritize technical depth. However, occasionally you come across code bases where file level hotspots just don't do the trick. And I want to give you an example by turning to different code base. So this is a code base that some of you might actually have running on your laptops right now. 
This is a part of the .NET Core runtime from Microsoft. And if you look at this visualization, you see that there, there is some, you know, almost like a group, a collection of hotspots in a package called GIT. So that's the just-in-time compilation uh, support in the .NET Core runtime. And we also see that to the right of the GIT package, there seems to be like a, a large hotspot that's almost like an island. And I highlighted it there. The name of that hotspot, you can see it on the visualization, is gc.cpp. And gc.cpp, it's the .NET garbage collector. And gc.cpp might look a little bit innocent. You sure see that it stands out, but it still looks relatively innocent in this visualization. But that's only due to the scale of .NET Core. .NET Core is a gigantic code base. So what you see on screen here is roughly 4 million lines of code. And gc.cpp is a big file. How big? I don't know. Let's look it up at GitHub, shall we? Yeah. Turns out that gc.cpp is simply too big to visualize with the syntax highlighting on GitHub. So we have to look at the raw text file. And when we do that, we see that gc.cpp is a single C++ file with 37,000 lines of C++. 37,000 lines of C++. So has anyone of you ever worked in C++? It's not as popular these days as it, as it used to be. I have to admit, I spent approximately a decade of my career, career, 10 years as a C++ developer. And I know, I know, those are 10 years and I will get back, right? But what that means is also I can really, really synthesize with the people maintaining this code because 37,000 lines of C++ is a scary thing. Let's face it. And besides, how useful is it to know that gc.cpp is a hotspot? I mean, it's obvious to confirm that it's correct, but how do you act upon this information? It's a little bit like the 4,000 years of technical debt. It's simply too much to be actionable. So what I do when I find a large hotspot is that I use a technique I call X-ray. Here's how it works. We take a large file and then we parse it into separate functions. And then we we'll look at the git log and see where do each commit hit over time. And we sum it up and we get hotspots on a function level. And this is what I use to prioritize specific and actionable refactorings. Let's look at the data from gc.cpp. We see that when I did this analysis, the number one hotspot in gc.cpp on a function level was a function called row brick card tables. We see that row brick cards tables is the most worked on function, and we see that it consists of 332 lines of code. That's a lot of code for a single function, isn't it? It is, it is for sure. But 332, it's much, much less than 37,000 lines of code, which was size of total file. And 332 lines of code is definitely less than 4 million lines of code, which was size of total system. So more important, we are now at the level where we can act upon this information and do a focused refactoring based on data from how we, as an organization, actually work with the code. All right, I'm going to come back to the hotspots again. But before I do that, I would like to take a step back and make a small reflection. Because how do you get to a single file with 37,000 lines of code? How does that happen? Why doesn't anyone refactor it much, much earlier before we get to that number? I think the best explanation I've seen on that is in this book, The Challenge Your Large Decision. It's a book I highly recommend. It's not about software at all, but it relates a lot to what we do. And that book is written by Diane Wagan. Diane Wagan isn't a software developer. She's a sociologist. And what she does, did was that she coined a theory called the normalization of deviance. And as a case study, she used the Challenger accident. So for those of you who might not remember the Challenger accident, what actually happened back in the 1980s was this. So if you look at the picture to the right, you see the Challenger as at its launch. So the actual space shuttle is to the left, 
with the United States uh, tax printed on it. What you see in front of you, uh, the, the orange part, that's the, like the main fuel tank, right? Full of rocket fuel. And in front of that, you have this white object. That's a solid rocket booster. And what actually happened was that those solid rocket boosters, they are huge, huge rockets. So they are transported, separated into three different segments that are then assembled before launch. And what happened in Challenger was that if you look closely, then to the right on that solid rocket booster, you can see a puff of gray smoke. That's not a good thing. It's not supposed to be there. Because what actually happened was that those different joints, where they joined the different segments of that solid rocket booster, they simply failed to seal at liftoff so that hot rocket gases could escape and impact the structure of the main fuel tank. And that simply meant that once Challenger got into the air, it simply, due to aerodynamic forces, it simply broke up and disintegrated. And the result was, uh, of course, a tragic loss of human lives and something that turned out could have been prevented. Because what Diane Wagan tells in her book on normalization of Debian's is that already in the 1970s, where the first design inspections were done of the solid rocket boosters, already there it was found out that the solid rocket booster joints, their actual performance didn't match the predicted and expected performance. So this is not a good thing, right? You're building a spaceship after all. It sounds dangerous. So what do you do? Well, if you're NASA, what you do is you form a committee. And they did. And they discussed the problem and they decided to pass it off as an acceptable risk. Years later, in the no early 1980s, during the first actual in-flight tests, again, there were some measurements that clearly showed that the solid rocket booster joints, their actual performance deviates from their predicted performance. Again, it was discussed and passed off as an acceptable risk. And it went on and on like that for years, until in 1986, the space shuttle exploded. And what's so fascinating about this is that this is what Diane Morgan calls the normalization of deviance. That each time we accept a deviation, we get a new point of reference. We get a new point of normal. And this is really, really dangerous. And I would like to say that we have exactly the same phenomenon within software. This is the reason we get to 37,000 lines of code. I mean, imagine that you start on a new project. Maybe you inherit a file, a complex hotspot with 5,000 lines of code. You might not be happy about it, but if you spend enough time with that module, after a while, it starts to become familiar. You start to find your way around. And besides, if you have 5,000 lines of code in a single hotspot, what difference does a couple of extra 100 lines of code do? So soon you have 6,000 lines of code, then you have 7,000 lines of code. So this is the way it continues. So how can we catch and detect the normalization of deviance in a hotspot? What I use is a technique I call complexity trends. So complexity trends are again calculated from version control data. So what I do is when I find a hotspot, I go to version control and I pull up each historic revision of that code. And I measure two points for each revision. The first is the blue line, which is a simple accumulation of the lines of code. The red line is a specific complexity metric. I focus on something I call nesting complexity. That is when you have if statements inside if statements inside if statements, because that's the kind of complexity that actually has some predictive value and is responsible for roughly 20% of our programming mistakes. But most of the time, you will see that lines of code and complexity tend to follow each other and correlate. And besides, the interesting thing here is never, ever the absolute numbers. The interesting thing is the pattern, the trends. So how do you interpret this? Well, the way I interpret this is that if we look at the data, we see that a year ago, we have this uh, dip in the red line and the blue line. So this looks like some kind of refactoring. Maybe some code was removed or maybe some code was cleaned up a little bit. And then it grows slowly until we reach a pretty steep increase, and then we plateau for a bit, and then we have a really, really steep recent increase in code complexity. And that steep increase is something I use as an early warning system. Because the normalization of deviance is one reason that whistleblowers are so important to an organization. 
and I have found that complexity trends of our hotspots make great whistleblowers in code so that we can pre prevent that our hotspots spiral out of control. So to sum up this first part of the talk, hotspots help us identify the code with the highest interest rate so that we can inspect them for prioritized technical depth in those areas where we have the largest return on investment. And the reason this works is because all code isn't equal. The development activity varies widely across different modules. And hotspots help us separate the stable parts of the code from the more volatile that need our attention. And finally, I showed you how you to use complexity trend to supervise your hotspots so that we can prevent the normalization of deviance. Now, I hope you found this interesting and that you would like to try this on your own code. So what kind of tools do I use to create these visualizations and these analyses? Well, you have to remember that this is a young discipline. When I started to work with hotspots, like maybe 10 years ago, there weren't any tools available that could do the kind of analysis I wanted to do. So I had to write my own tools. And I open sourced my first tool suite. It's something I call CodeMath. It's available on my GitHub page. It's entirely free. What I've been working on for the past five years is a more advanced tool called CodeSyn. So CodeSyn can also uh, provide code level metrics and automatically separate good hotspots from bad hotspots. And of course, automates all the steps in the analysis. So CodeSyn is available at codesyn.io. It's entirely free for open source and uh, available for uh, closed source projects as well. So if you're interested in these techniques, please consider to have a look at CodeSyn and support it. Finally, I always find it so fascinating that you can actually get far with just a command line. So I have lots of examples in, on this in my latest book, Software Design X-Rays, and my favorite example is this. Did you know that with git log, if you pass it the minus L flag, then you can specify a function inside a file and have git trace the evolution of that function. So this is basically like the basis of an X-ray right at your command line. All right, you're going to get the references at the end of the talk as well. Before I get there, I like to scale it up a little bit and talk about architecture and more specifically organizations. And I would like to start with a concept from social psychology called process loss. So process loss is a concept from social psychology that social psychologists have borrowed from the field of mechanics. And the idea is that just like a machine cannot operate at 100% efficiency all the time due to things like friction and heat loss, neither cannot team. So the way this model works is that let's say you have a number of individuals. Together, they have a potential productivity. However, what you get out of a team is never the full potential. The actual productivity is always slightly smaller. And part of the potential is simply lost. What kind of loss is that? Well, it depends on the task. But in a complex endeavor like software development, where we have lots of interdependent tasks, lots of people, a large part of our process loss is simply due to coordination and communication overhead. And the thing is that we can never, ever get rid of process loss. It's a very well-researched uh, topic within social psychology. The trick is, of course, to try to minimize it. And that's why we have things like processes and collaborative practices. So the first step towards that improvement is to understand how severe is your process loss today. And that's something I like to cover. And one of the most common reasons I've seen for process loss within software is something called diffusion of responsibility. This is another topic from um, social psychology. And here's the thing, the future of responsibility is something that's studied in the real world. And it's something that you might have experienced yourself if you've been unfortunate enough to witness an accident or an emergency. What you might have been able to notice is that the larger any group of potential bystanders, the less likely that any individual will offer help. So this is really, really scary. So it turns out that if we ever find ourselves in an emergency, we're better off if there are just one or two other people that can help us rather than 50 or 100. The more bystanders, the less likely anyone will help. 
This is a scary thing. And this also explains a lot of the observations of Diamond Software, because the future of responsibility is a very human thing. And it's humans like us that write software, right? And we have the same biases there. So one thing that surprised me was that when I analyze code and I find overly complicated hotspots, what I tend to see is that those hotspots, they have been problems for years. And still, no one had really acted upon them. But then I do a second inspection. Using virtual control data, I can calculate how many people have been working on this part of the code. And what I typically find is a very strong correlation that the more people that are working on that code, the less likely that anyone will refactor it. And again, I think the root cause is the diffusion of responsibility. So if we have an important social perspective, a social bias like this, why don't we measure it? Because diffusion of responsibility leads to process loss. How can we measure something like that? Well, remember, we are in version control wonderland, meaning our version control system knows exactly which developer that wrote which piece of code and when they did it. So what I do is I simply go to version control and then I look at, I can do this on individual level, but I typically find it more interesting to take individuals and map them to different development teams. So I simply aggregate contributions from all developers that work on a specific team. And by using that, I can calculate things like uh, team coupling. How many different teams work in the same parts of the code at any given time? And I use color to visualize that. The visualization you see, it's the same style that I used for uh, hotspots. Only now the colors carry a different meaning. The more red something is, the higher the overlap between different teams in that part of the code. And you see an example here. This is an example from um, another Microsoft code base, ASP.NET and VC Core. And we see to the right there, there's a cluster of modules that seems to have a lot of access parallel development by members of different teams. And this is problematic because not only does it expose us to the diffusion of responsibility by us? It also makes changes more risky. Did you know that the number of developers touching a piece of code in parallel is one of the best predictors you can have the number of defects you will find in that code? And now you have multiple teams working in the same parts of the code. That also increases the risk for things like unexpected feature interactions, which are some of the worst bugs we can have. So, this is clearly data that I would like to act upon. How do we do that? Well, uh, it's challenging. It's more challenging to act upon than the hotspots because there might be multiple root causes. One is, of course, that uh, we might have a shared responsibility in our code base that lacks a clear ownership. So maybe the solution is to introduce a new team to take on a shared responsibility. Or a very common finding is that code attracts contributors for many different teams because it has good reasons to do so. The code typically has multiple responsibilities. It's low on cohesion, it does too many things. So the reason multiple teams have to work on it is because they might work on different features, different issues, but they all end up in the same part of the code because that code has so many responsibilities. So this is something you can find with a technical analysis or a code inspection, and if you find that, what you might have to do is that you might have to take that code and you might have to split it according to its different responsibilities so that you separate that code. And that also helps you align the teams to distinct modules in the code so that you can minimize parallel work. So it's interesting that you can sometimes solve what looks like organizational challenges with a technical refactoring. But this is really just a starting point just like we can find uh, team coordination issues like this, we can also start to measure things like Conway's law that we normally just talk about. Here we can get actual objective data. And Conway's law at its essence is how well aligned is our organization, the way we organize into teams with the way our software architecture works. So what I did in this analysis was again, I picked version control data to figure out where have each individual worked. I aggregated that into teams and I assign each team a specific color, and the team that has worked the most in a specific part of the code gets the color of that piece of the code. So 
what I want to see here from perspective of Conway's law is I want to see an alignment between the architecture and the teams. Because the better aligned they are, the cheaper it's going to be, the easier the communication. And if I look at this visualization really, really quick, I see it looks like an almost perfect alignment, right? Each one of those larger bubbles that represent features have the same color, meaning one team is responsible for each feature. They're operational responsibilities, right? So it's this is the way it actually looks from the code. So this is beautiful. This is like uh, Conway's Law Nirvana, right? However, I have to admit that all examples you see in this presentation are from real world code bases, except this one. I had to make it up because I'm yet to find an organization that's that well aligned with their architecture. So let me show you what it might look like in a real world case study. So this is the same kind of visualization, the same uh, analysis, but from a commercial code base. And it's an example I'm allowed to show as long as I keep the data anonymous in order to you know, protect the guilty. So what happened here was that this was a large organization and they were using component teams. And by using component teams, they found that they had a lot of handovers. They had a, to do a lot of coordination between in the interfaces between the different components. So they had pretty long lead times. But then someone went to an agile conference and they decided that, hey, you know what? Let's switch it around. Instead of component teams, let's do feature teams so that one team can implement a feature end to end. Beautiful. So what they did was they took their existing organization, sliced it into 12 different feature teams, and then they started to assign features to each team, almost like a round, rob round robin style. And they let the teams loosen the code base. And what you see here on screen is what the work distribution between the different teams looked like for just one sprint. Can you see any patterns here? And compare it to the previous image. No. You cannot see any pattern because there isn't anyone. What this visualization shows you is that you have contributors from all different teams working across the whole code base all the time. But you have 12 teams working the same parts of the code, but for different reasons, since they work on different stories. So not only is this going to be incredibly expensive to coordinate for different teams, because they're going to run into a lot of conflicts in the code, it's also going to be a communication disaster. And to make it worse, what happens here is that you miss synergies between different features. That is, you miss opportunities to make simplifications in the solution domain, where simplifications really, really have a big impact. So whatever you do, and I'm going to give another session on this tomorrow where I go much deeper into the social and organizational aspects of code. But whatever you do, align your architecture and your organization. Your code is going to thank you for it. So I've come to this to the end of this session, and I hope you enjoyed this journey through the fascinating field of evolving code and what I call behavioral code analysis, where we emphasize the behavior of the organization with respect to the code as much as we emphasize the code itself. And ultimately, it's all about writing better software. Software that's able to evolve with the pressure of new features, novel usages, and change circumstances. And I'm pretty convinced that writing code of that quality will never, ever be easy. So I think we as developers, we need all the support we can get. And I hope that this introduction to behavioral code analysis has inspired you to investigate the field in more depth. And to get started, I have a number of resources here. I have my new book, Software Design X-Rays, that covers all of these techniques in uh, much more depth. I also blog about it regularly at uh, codesim.com and my private blog at antornhill.com where I have different case studies and examples. And if you're interested in trying this out, you might want to have a look at codesim.io where I have some interactive analysis examples. You can actually explore different well-known open source projects. So now, before I take questions, I just want to take this opportunity and say thanks a lot for listening to me and may the code be with you. Thank you. Awesome, Adam. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see the likes coming in? Yeah, I can. I hope we can. Oh. So you, there's a rain of uh, likes coming in right now for you, which actually shows how much people are, love the session. And trust me, throughout the session, I saw a lot of interaction 
where a lot of people were trying to let you know that um, you know they're loving every concept that you're picking out on the screen. So uh, unfortunately, since you're on presentation mode, you were not able to see it, but I was actually watching that happen. And the reins are still in. I'm going to start picking out questions because there are tons of questions. Uh, people, uh, I apologize, uh, apologies if we are not able to take all the questions, but we are surely going to have um, Adam available for another 15 or 20 minutes uh, at the lounge. He'll, he's going to grab a table so you can grab a seat there. You can watch the conversation as well. There's a watch uh, a link on the side next to the table as well. But Adam, uh, let's get to the questions because there are quite a few many questions out there. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to start with the first one. Did you mention a tool that creates the hotspot? Uh, yes. So uh, for, the, yeah, for the tooling, there are several options. Uh, what I recommend if you want to get started quickly is to uh, have a look at the uh, code scene. Uh, that's the most uh, advanced tool. Then I have the, my open source project, the uh, CodeMat. So if you go to my GitHub, Adam Thornhill at GitHub, you will find it. And it's a command line tool that's uh, easy to get started with as well. And it can do the hotspot analysis. And uh, you have those links. If you if you Google me, you will find them. And uh, I can give you specific link links in the link as well. So I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Yep, yep, yes, yes, it does. Find him on GitHub. Uh, complexity referred here is cyclomatic complexity and or cognitive complexity or anything different. That's a question from Sri Devi. Yeah, so of, of those, I, I like uh, cognitive complexity the best. But what I tend to use is I look, I have two different complexity metrics. Uh, you know what? I'm actually going to share a link uh, to one of my blogs where I discuss this because I cannot talk about it. Awesome. You can actually. Uh, put it on the audience uh, chat if you would like. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to do that. Uh, so let's see here. I sent it in the audience chat. Here we go. So what I do is basically I, I don't care so much about cyclomatic complexity. Cyclomatic complexity is a very rough metric. It It's basically the only thing it's useful for is to estimate the number of unit tests you might need. But what's interesting is to look at the number of uh, nesting levels. So I basically count how many nested conditionals do I have in each function. And that's very closely related to cognitive complexity as well. So I recommend those. But if you don't have it, then just a simple count of number of lines of code takes you pretty far and points in the right direction. Awesome. Uh, so the next question is from Anaka. She's asking, does the code scene work for application code developed in any technology or, or language? Uh, basically, most languages. I think code scene now supports uh, 25 different programming languages. So all the big languages, you know, Golang, C Sharp, C++, uh, Java, Python. And uh, it's growing all the time. So we're adding support for more and more languages uh, all the time. The only language support that has been requested that I know that we lack today is Rust. So that, that's going to be uh, next up. Next up, okay. Uh, next question is from Jocelyn. She's asking, how do we get the X-ray of our code or complexity of the code? It, you need to use uh, tooling for it. I mean, um, it's um, the calculations themselves are not hard, but they are very cumbersome to do for a human. So uh, you basically, to do the X-ray, you have to parse the source code. That's the most challenging thing. To calculate hotspots at the file level, you just need to look at the change frequencies. And I have examples in my book on how you can do this uh, just from a command line. But the X-ray requires you to understand the source code so you can parse it into different functions. And then simply look at the Git log where each function has been modified. So that's where you need the tooling support. And I gave this example on how you can, you can build your own scripts, if you want, using uh, git log and the minus l flag and kind of trace functions, use that as an x-ray. Or you can look at, uh, I mean, CodeStin automates that, for example. So if you're interested in that space, that's another option. I'm going to take one last question, Adam, because there's just too many questions. And I'm so sorry uh, for the people whose questions are not being picked right now. Uh, time is our villain. Um, is there... Okay, code scene looks at technical debt related to what aspect? Maintainability, reliability, or security? Is there a particular aspect? Uh, 
it's the maintainability and the financial uh, aspect. Uh, how how uh, expensive is it to maintain that code? So if you want to increase your uh, delivery efficiency, uh, Codesyn will point you in the right direction. Uh, Codesyn doesn't address uh, security. There are so many good security tools already, but I don't find so much uh, uh, so much tooling support for this financial uh, aspect of software development. How do we become more efficient? How do we make our job more fun? How do we get rid of the most important thing like that? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the audience one time uh, if we, if we, I know it's the lunch break now, so can we take another five minutes? If you guys are okay in staying back for another five minutes, hit a, hit a thumbs up, please. Uh, I see a lot of thumbs up, so let's take another question. Uh, sorry, Adam, I'm just going to, uh, I mean, this is anyways the thing that we're going to do at the lounge, so let's just uh, have some more uh, work done here. Is there any way we visualize the effectiveness of collective code ownership? Uh, yes, yeah, so th there are ways of uh, visualizing that. It's, I have to say, this is an area that's um, still evolving. I, again, I have a blog on it. Let me post that one for if you want to dig deeper. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow as well. Uh, so I'm just looking for the link to the blog. And I'm posting in the chat now. This is something called Visualize Proof as well. So what you can do is that you can basically look at uh, how much output you get. Because that's the interesting thing. You need some kind of some business-related metric. So what I typically do is I integrate data from... Uh, lifecycle tools like Jira, Trello, Azure DevOps. And then I look at how much um, does do we manage to deliver? What's our throughput? And then you can look at, all right, what happens when we, um, we change the teams? If we go to collective code ownership model, does, does it have a positive impact? Or, um, or does it lead to less output? So that's the quantitative metric that I'm interested in. But it's also very, very important to have some kind of quality metric. And the one I tend to use is the number of uh, bugs that slip through. Because it's very easy to increase throughput if you uh, skip quality. So you actually need both to balance each other. And this is what I tend to see in um, works really, really well in practice. So I hope I managed to clarify. Otherwise, I'd be happy to elaborate in the, in the launch. Uh, that question was from Rajiv. Rajiv, if you're uh, listening to this, uh, he's so he just mentioned that he's going to have a talk tomorrow, so you know what to do next. The um, uh, rest of the folks, uh, th thank you so much for your questions. Uh, Adam is going to be available at the lounge. Uh, thank you so much, Adam, for the wonderful session. I'm sure everybody was glued to their screen, and that's pretty evident with the thumbs up that are still coming in. Um, I, would, uh, I would also take a moment to thank uh, the sponsors for the session, Agile Alliance. Uh, thank you for sponsoring the session for us. Um, guys, if you loved the session, uh, which I obviously felt you guys did. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, everybody, for joining in.